Hi, and welcome to video lecture three. This video lecture is on calculus, an introduction to calculus, and particularly the derivative. Um, this is the first of part two of the class covering the topic of calculus in one dimension. Now, calculus is often viewed by students as one of the hardest things to learn the first time through. However, it sort of forms the bedrock to a lot of later material, and it's important. So what I'm gonna take time in this module to do is to talk a little bit about why we're going to go through the process of learning calculus. So what is it used for? What is it? What exactly is calculus? And why are we going to learn it? Well, let's start by, looking, by asking the question of how do we understand change? Now, fundamentally, political science and really all sciences is about understanding change. Right? Causality is, in effect, a way of understanding change. If I change one thing, how does something else change? How does variation in something A cause variation in something B? Variation is fundamentally change, right? Change from one value to another value. How do we measure that, right? How do we understand change? Well, some change we understand already. For instance, right, if we have discrete things, we can understand change pretty simply, right? If at some time now there are 300 million people in the country, and at some future time, there are 350 million people in the country. Well, between this time and that time, there has been a change of 50 million people arriving in the country. Okay, so that's a clear one. That's a sort of discrete change. Right? Discrete change in general is pretty straightforward to understand, and we've done a little with that earlier in the previous lectures, looking at percentage change and so on, right, to understand how change happens from one point to another point. The same thing is true with functions. So for instance, let's draw just some random function. And if we had to ask, okay, how does things how does that function change between this point, we'll call it x1, and this point, which we'll call x2, well, we could find the value of the function at this point. And this would be f of x1. And the function at this point would be f of x2. And how does the function change? Well, the, the change is the difference between x2, f of x2, and f of x1. So it's a discrete, well-defined thing. Right? And in general, all change that has that sort of discrete character is pretty straightforward. You don't need calculus to understand how things change from one moment to the next, right? as long as those moments are separated by some discrete time. Right? The thing is, um, the function I drew here, this is a continuous function, right? As we discussed in the previous video set of video lectures, continuous functions um, cover all the space between the points. So what if I don't want to know how things change from one point to another, but how things are changing at a given point, right? What if the real question I'm interested in is, how is that function changing at the point x1? Now you might ask, why would I possibly want to know that, right? Most change in everyday life occurs between two points, right? Why would I ever want to know how things change at a single point? Well, it turns out there's two major uses for this in political science, in social science in general, and really a large branch of science in total. One use, and the use that will be the primary use you'll be using um, in most political science classes, is to understand what is called infinitesimal change. Instant, sorry, instantaneous change. Change at an instantaneous point. Change at a single point. Now again, why do we need to know that? Because change at a single point can help us understand the behavior of the function. And functions represent our model of reality. So for instance, let's clear that, draw a new function. This, as we'll see later, is a function typically associated with some kind of preference, some kind of satiable preference. Right? So here's some point here. Um, and we're trying to find the maximum of this function. Right? Say we want, so well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's say this function represents our preference over something, some satiable preference. So if this is some x, the more we get of that x, the happier we are. Up until this point here, we can call it z. Beyond that point, we like getting x less and less. So this is a satiable preference. We have a limit to how much we like. We are satiated at z, 
More than that, we're actually less and less happy. This is also often associated with policy preferences. Well, how do we actually look at the, analyze this, this kind of preference? Well, we might be interested in knowing where that preference is maximized, where we get our best possible outcome. Now, you can look at the function and say, well, the best possible outcome is that z there. It's the highest point. But how do we know that? Well, let's consider how the function is changing. Okay, over here, let me get to change my color here. Uh, how do I do that? Oh, yeah. Um, in this region here, right, the function is increasing. Right? The function is increasing in that region. How do I know that? Well, between any two points, it seems like it's going, it's increasing. It's, the value is higher at points to the right than they were than it was to the points to the left. Right? The function is increasing. Now over here, in the blue, the function is decreasing. Again, as I move to the right, the values of the function get lower and lower. What about right here? In the green point, what's happening there? Nothing. The function at that very top of that function, it is neither increasing nor decreasing. The function for a moment stops. It's the same way as if you threw a ball in the air, right? First the ball rises. At some point, for just a moment, it stops at the top, the apex of that um, parabola, that, that curve, and it falls back to the ground. As it's moving up, it slows down. It stops for a moment at the top, and then slowly accelerates down to the ground again. At that moment, the change in its speed, its velocity, is zero. At the top, at this green part here, at the top of this curve, the change in the function is zero. And it turns out, as we'll see um, in video lecture course uh, seven, three, four, five, sorry, six, video course six, that um, the way to figure out, or a way to figure out what the maximum of a function is, is to identify the points at which the function stops changing was the rate of change is actually zero. And we'll see the reason for that. You can get an intuitive grasp already by looking at this picture. As it goes up, the rate at which it's increasing gets less. It stops increasing, and then it has to go down again. When it changes its direction of change, that's the point the rate of change is zero, and that's the maximum or the minimum of the function. And we'll do a whole lot more of that when we deal with optimization in a few video lectures. But this is one of the primary reasons we care about calculus. It helps us identify the point of instantaneous change of the function. Now we'll see how that works um, starting in the next video lecture, the next module of this class. But for now, just note, optimizing functions is probably the most important thing we're going to do with calculus in political science. It's trying to understand the rate of change of a function at a particular point, the instantaneous rate of change in part because it helps identify the optimum of a function. For instance, if this is utility, this would help us um, identify the maximum utility, which is what we should be doing in game theory, is taking the action that gives us maximum utility, conditional on everything else. Okay. So that's one way. That's one reason we, we look at this, is to try to identify continuous change, the change in a function at, e at a single point continuously throughout the entire function. Why else? Well, one way you can think about derivatives um, and the ra instantaneous rate of change of a function is effectively a derivative. We'll talk more about that next next class, next module, sorry. Um, habits die hard. That's one reason for it. But we can also consider a different reason, which is, let's assume that horribly misshapen thing is a bell curve. <laughs> um, and we can ask ourselves, first of all, as we'll see in the probability class um, set of video lectures, again, sorry, um, the, this bell curve here can represent a probability distribution, a distribution telling us the chance that anything happens. Um, you might have seen this before, you know, in different, in undergraduate or even previously, because bell curves come up a lot in everyday life. For instance, if you took the SATs or the GREs, the bell curve is often what the scores are supposed to be fit to. 
So this curve will trace a bell curve, and you can tell, for instance, that there's like 68% probability to be in this region, and so on. Um, that's supposed to be an eight, I don't know what I'm doing there. Anyway, the point is, um, how do we know that 68%? How do we know what the percentages are here? It turns out that the percentages are the areas under this curve. How do we find the areas under a curve? Well, in discrete land, we can just add things, right? So for instance, I could draw a whole bunch of um, rectangles and add them all up. And that would get me a pretty good approximation of the area under the curve. And we'll talk about that more in a couple of video lectures. And in fact, similar methods to that are how computers approximate um, integrals, which are the areas under the curve. Um, however, what if you want to actually be exact? Well, we're missing all this shaded region in here, right? We're missing these regions. We can draw ever smaller rectangles and get more and more of those regions, but we always miss something unless the width of the rectangles is infinitesimally small. As it goes to zero in the limit, we get all the points. And dealing with that limit, those infinitesimals, is the realm of calculus. Figuring out the change in a function as it's at a particular point means you're going closer and closer, you're taking the change between two points closer and closer to a single point. That's a, that's a, a limit. A limit as the, that difference goes to zero. For an integral, to get the area under the curve, you're taking those, those um, rectangles smaller and smaller and smaller until they go to zero in the limit. Calculating these, this area under the curve helps us understand probabilities and probabilities are central to all of science. So understanding the integral is the second thing we primarily do in using calculus. Um, and now I've thrown a lot of stuff at you um, pretty quickly. Infinitesimals, right? Really, really small things that exist but have effectively no width, right? That's a tricky concept. And we'll talk a lot more about that as the, as the video lectures go on. But for now, I just want to get a handle on understanding that it's understanding instantaneous things, things in the limit as they go to zero, that's the realm of calculus. Understanding change as the period of the space or time or whatever that the change happens in goes to zero. That's where calculus is really useful. And it's useful primarily for us in terms of understanding optimization and performing optimization and also in computing integrals for probability distributions. Thank you very much, and in the next lecture we'll start going into more detail about the derivative itself. Thank you.